Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913. More than 25 years ago, the late Professor Paul Borgie developed an interview series that he called Reflections in Time. It was intended to preserve some of the history of the University of Nebraska at Omaha by recording the experiences of faculty and others who contributed to its development. With the aid of the UNO Alumni Association, I began this new series to continue Paul's work. My name is Jack Newton. I'm retired now, but I'm still active as a professor emeritus. I've been on the faculty of UN Omaha since 1960 and served for 20 years as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I worked closely with Professor Borgie in the development of his original interview series, and I can think of no more fitting tribute to him than to continue this work. It's a somewhat overcast day in the late September, the year is 2006, and I have as my guest in the studio today Dr. Mark Rousseau from the Sociology Department here at UN Omaha. Mark, welcome. We're glad to have you with us today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, let's talk about you a little bit <coughs> to begin with, anyhow. You're currently a professor of sociology, right? Yes. You served mm -hmm. a number of years as uh, department chairman in that uh, department of sociology, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, too. And you came here in 1968. I can't imagine yeah, it's I, that long I ago. I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see, I believe, no, you weren't dean when I came. No, I, not, not for was, several uh, years later. Right, I was Department right. chairman back then. That's right, right. Yes, 1968. That, that was an the exciting 60s, time and, oh, because we had just become a state university. It was. That was one of the reasons that I decided to come here. It looked like that was going to, well, it had yeah. happened. So yeah. you were never here in the days of Correct. Omaha University. Correct. Right. Probably would not have come under those yeah. circumstances. Uh, let's talk a little bit about you because I know that you uh, did your uh, a couple of degrees at Indiana University, so I presume that maybe you came from that part Correct. of the country. Correct. I was born and grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, mm -hmm. and uh, went to school there, uh, public school all the way through. I'm a mm -hmm. big public all my life. I've been in public education. Really believe in it. Um, so you uh, you grew up in Indiana then. What was what was it like? Uh, Growing up that, in, a, in a uh, midwestern town like right in the fifties and sixties, Indiana uh, is was particularly less so now a large industrial center. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a planning engineer at International Harvester, the big uh, truck company, and uh, well, there were a number of major manufacturers there. Uh, IH, General Electric had three plants. Uh, uh, Wirehauser, uh, IT and T. It was, so it was a big manufacturing. Yeah. And in those days, that, those were the boom years of the economy. And as a matter of fact, a couple summers uh, during my uh, years in college, my father managed to get me on at Harvester, and made really great money, uh, equivalent of today's dollars, about twenty-five thousand a year. Wow. That was United Auto Workers, of course, Local Fifty Two. Yeah. A great experience. I really hated it at the time, but I treasure it now. Um, now, I presume that you decided to go to Indiana University because that was close by. Correct. Right. Um, I was lucky. I was one of those kids who had a stay-at-home mother, mm -hmm. uh, but which meant my father had uh, five people to feed and clothe and educate all, and they were very big on education. They kept pushing education. And so it was pretty much, yes, go in state, and my dad was a Purdue grad in engineering, and I didn't want to go to Purdue. <laughs> I didn't want to be an engineer. And he was—he pushed IU, 
and uh, so I was happy to uh, happy to go there. My father kind of pushed uh, medical school pre-med. He thought it'd be mm -hmm. nice to have a physician, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, so that's where I started out there. And you got two degrees there, Bachelor of Science? Yeah, ba yes, Bachelor of Arts. Oh, Bachelor of Arts, I'm sorry. And MA, in, both in sociology. Okay. Right. Yeah, that was where, in many ways, I would say my undergraduate education was just one of the high points of my life. I just loved it. Um, How'd you get interested in sociology? Well, uh, in high school, I was kind of a, I wasn't in the, what do you say, the, uh, the sport, and the, I wasn't in the front group, you know, I was kind of one of the other guys. So I take it you didn't play and basketball? No, I Indiana. didn't play, uh, that was not my <laughs> thing. Uh, in fact, I was in the band, uh, that was, I played clarinet in the high school band, and that exempted me from phys ed, which I was real <laughs> pleased about. <laughs> so... Uh, I was sort of a, I, I was a good student, I made the honor roll, but I didn't like to do any more than I really had to. I had a principle of never studying more than one uh, subject in an evening. So I got to Indiana, and there I found out that ideas were important. People rewarded you for ideas, and I, I really thrived, and I uh, lived in the men's quadrangle, and people were always questioning, well, Mark, how do you know that? Why do you, why do you think that's true? Well, I just had all these things. That, and so uh, it, it was a wonderful growth period in my life, and uh, I really look back and treasure it. I started out in pre-med then, and uh, it was okay. I got it five hours of A in developmental anatomy, which rather surprised <laughs> me. But organic chemistry, that was the third big chem course I had to take, was tough. I enjoyed it. I liked the precision, the ordering of the field but I worked like a dog and got five hours at sea and I decided it was time to take something else, major in something else, and in the meantime to meet a uh, division requirement, I'd taken an introductory sociology course. And I just got really turned on. I said, hey, these people are talking about things that I've always wondered about that nobody talks about, like wealth, uh, poverty, uh, power, who gets it and who doesn't. And so I really got excited and took some more soch, and here I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you went on to North Carolina, I presume, because that had an excellent reputation they did. in that field. They, they do. Uh, they've always, in sociology and many other disciplines, but at least in sociology, it's always been a top ten department. And that's sort of an interesting story, too. Um, during my m undergraduate years, uh, late 50s, early 60s, my mother... Uh, for a time had what was then called a mental breakdown and it was largely I think due to stress of uh, three kids to take care of at home and her dying father that she was helping to care for. Anyhow, she was hospitalized for a short period of time and I'm happy to say years ago of course made a full and complete recovery. So as a result of that I kind of got interested in mental illness and the social etiology of mental illness and decided I'd like to do my work in medical sociology. And so I, those again were the glory days in higher education where opportunity and a lot of money was available. Uh, I applied to four universities, Carolina, uh, University of Texas, Washington U in St. Louis, and University of Connecticut. And I got admitted to all four and got money at all four. So I was in a nice, and here's the, sort of the odd thing, and I think many people do that, make choices for pretty subjective reasons. My father had two sisters that lived in the South, and so as a child, we would go visit them on summer vacation. So I had been in the South. I knew it was somehow different, uh, and I was sort of intrigued about that. So on that basis, <laughs> I said, well, I'll go to North Carolina and see what the South is like. And I knew it was a good department, but I didn't know it was a top 10 department uh, until after I got there. And I remember early my first semester at Carolina, some of the senior graduate students put on a little symposium for the new graduate students, kind of talked about the history of the university and particularly of the social department. It really made a name for itself in the 1920s and it carried on ever since. And I said, oh, gulp, what am I doing? <laughs> but uh, as one does, I put my nose to the stone and, and survived and it was a great experience. That was also the time, uh, I think I... When you interviewed Marianne Lamont, I think she touched on these issues a little bit too. I got there in 63, and Chapel Hill is still uh, relatively segregated. And as a kid from the North, of course, I had no experience with this. I, I was, you know, completely surprised. 
So, for example, there were segregated barber shops. Uh, the film theaters were segregated. African Americans sat in the balcony. Uh, many of the restaurants uh, excluded blacks. And so, uh, like a number of other students at the time, I got involved in uh, in sit-ins and uh, civil rights movement. Uh, and um, I remember the bus station, you know, there was a, a, well, they call it colored, but an African American and a white waiting room. Of course, that all changed, but we were there in the process of change, and that was, again, part of those very turbulent times. That should have been interesting for a sociologist. Uh, very much, yeah. very much, and then kind of related to that, and I take pride in this depending on one's politics, but uh, it was also about that time that uh, the Vietnam War began to crank up and President Johnson cooked up this Gulf of Tonkin incident that was a complete fabrication. At any rate, I'm happy to say beginning in 1965, uh, we had a, month, a weekly vigil uh, protesting the war, just a silent vigil along uh, Franklin Street, the main street in Chapel Hill. And I participated in that, and kind of continued those activities when I came here. So I was well, let's definitely get you opposed to that UNO, war. You, uh, that, let's do that. 1968 <laughs> when you yes, came here, right? And, um, uh, uh, but you didn't uh, you didn't get your doctoral degree till 1971. You would that mention that, that. You <laughs> came here a little uh, correct. ABD, right, right? All but dissertation. Right. So I presume you were working on your dissertation was, while you were here. Right. Was that a hard thing to do? To yes, it was. And I don't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a young child uh, uh, at that time. He was five, my son, Mark Jr. And um, partly my dissertation was an analysis of secondary data. I worked with one of the senior members of the department. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in the social correlates of educational achievement. So. We had a large national sample of some 15,000 students, a uh, random sample across the country. Well, one of the problems I ran into when I knew that this would be a problem when I came for the interview was at UNO that time. At that time, we did not have, com we, these were all punch cards, and we didn't handle equipment that could handle this kind of a massive job. And so uh, I had to run all my analyses uh, in Chapel Hill. I remember that summer before I left, I was just <laughs> living in the computer lab down there. But I got that done, but I came here with buckets of printouts and, and uh, lots of papers. So yes, I uh, had to work in the summers. I was developing new courses. And uh, so it took me about two summers to get the dissertation done. And it was, a, of course, a huge relief. I went back for right. commencement. I'll bet it was. But I don't recommend that, all right. Um, well, how did you happen to come to Omaha then? Well, uh, like at least in sociology, most people who re recruit have never been to Omaha. And uh, I just thought of it as some kind of a flat, treeless place out on the prairie somewhere. And uh, it, by that time, I had been at two uh, major universities, Indiana and Carolina, you know, Division mm -hmm. 1A kind of universities, and uh, saw what it took to be a success in a department of that kind. I mean, I, I loved being there and I loved sociology, but I also wanted to have a personal life. And so I was looking uh, for a school like UNO where I could uh, do teaching and research and yet uh, I could have a family life and a, and a personal life. And so I believe uh, here in the University of Cincinnati, Ball State were a couple of the kind of places I was looking at. And I came out here for the interview. I thought, well, let's see what Omaha looks like. And like the people, like the fact uh, we had just go were going into the state system and looked like a nice place for a lot of opportunity. A friend of mine uh, at Carolina, Hugh Whit, had gone to UNL in Lincoln just the year before. And so I talked to Hugh a couple of times, told him I was thinking of coming to UNO. And he said, oh, sure, Mark. He said, it's sort of like I'm looking here at Lincoln, good place to start. You start out, you get some publications and move on, and that was sort of the plan. Well, when I got here, and then six years later got tenure, there were no places to, that was when the job market had entirely changed, and I was glad to have tenure. I hadn't thought I would be here uh, for my career, but it's worked out real well. What was your first impression of the university when you walked out of the campus? Well, uh, coming from Bloomington and Chapel Hill, <laughs> it was a different <laughs> feel. I mean, I knew it would be. Uh, 
then versus now, it of course was a much smaller campus, a uh, much fewer buildings. Only a few buildings. Yes, uh, arts and sciences and engineering and the field house and I guess the uh, the Epley building, which the was library. then the library, right. And one thing I, I must say, uh, there was very little landscape. Uh, one of the things, um, what's his name, who is in charge of landscape? I would like to, can't think of it right. He done a fabulous job uh, here at UNO. And just the, the plants, the flowers have made it a huge enhancement. I mean, that's one of the really remarkable differences, as well as the size of the campus and, uh, and the buildings. Um, what was the department like back then? How many people there roughly? were? Let's see. Uh, George Helling was chair of the department mm -hmm. at that time, and he was on a uh, sabbatical leave in Turkey, and so I was interviewed and hired by Wayne Wheeler, who was acting chair, and uh, he managed to get money for four positions that year. Sort of an interesting story there. So, uh, fall of '68, when I arrived, there were four new faculty, uh, fresh out of major graduate schools. Uh, myself, Carolina, Minnesota, several others, and we were all 60s guys, you know. Well, then George Helling uh, came back from his year of work in Turkey, and uh, we met him. It was a little risky, you know, not knowing who your department chair was going to be, but it seemed like a nice enough guy, and he was. But uh, one of the things that happened along about October of that first fall, uh, all of a sudden, he tacked up on his office door what the spring schedule was going to be, who was going to be teaching what at what time. Well, here's us four new guys, and we said, wait a minute, <laughs> this isn't the way colleagues do this. And so that uh, led to some turmoil in the department, and the upshot was uh, we adopted Robert's Rules of Order at that time as the, as the guideline for making department decisions in business. And George left at the end of that first year and went to uh, St. Olaf College, where he had taught before he came here. So that was sort of interesting. Yeah, well, back in uh, 1968 was a major, a year of major growth. Yes, it was. And that's why uh, all departments had, uh, had that kind of development, where right. we hired a lot of new people. Right. And I, I'm trying to remember, I, I know that our <coughs> student body increased by at least 25 percent in that uh, in that one period. There. Going into the state uh, system made all the difference, yes. and that's why I and I think most of us, many people came then, and students as well, because I, it reminds me of a little story. I don't remember if it was my first year here or maybe the second year, but at any rate, uh, at the beginning of the fall semester, one Sunday evening, there was a reception uh, for the faculty and the regents were here as a chance mm -hmm. to walk through the line, shake hands, and meet the regents. And uh, back then, my beard and my hair were a little, <laughs> a little longer, a little shaggier than they are today. I kind of evolved with the norms. But at any rate, going uh, through the line, and w one of the regents uh, shook hands, partial guy, but he pressed a nickel in my hand. He said, "Here, if you if you want to, here's help for a haircut." <laughs> that was Ed Schwartzkopf. Okay. I remember him very oh well. yes. He, okay. Uh, he died just recently. Okay. Yeah. Is that right? Well, I will never forget that. Yeah. Another little kind of curious thing um, happened my first year here in terms of then and now and the changes. There was a rule uh, in the student center that uh, in the cafeteria, in the dining room, you are not permitted to take in any books. Uh, they said it was a shortage of space and students, and nor faculty. Really was. I know it was <laughs> a shortage, but I thought, what in the world is this? A university, you can't have a book in the cafeteria. So I just ignored that, and there was a woman who patrolled and had a little... Oh, I remember her, too. I can't I, remember I, her. You're right. I, remember her I had a little verbal exchange with her. I mean, I realized she was doing her job. And I can't remember if I wrote a letter to the Gateway or I talked to uh, the director of the student center. Anyhow, uh, several of us certainly got that rule changed. It just seemed so yeah. patently absurd to me. Well, I guess the reason what for that was that, um, as you said, a shortage of space. Right. But people who brought books in with them and We'd, talked during lunch right. that way would take up, would stay at the tables longer right. and uh, consequently right. you had right. less room for other people. Anyhow, to somehow we managed to negotiate. We did take <laughs> books in, but still people seemed to get fed. Yeah. So maybe they extended the hours, I don't know. Well, tell me, what was the, um, 
curriculum in sociology like back then? Was it much different than it is Not today? Not a whole lot. We clearly have evolved it as we've hired different faculty and uh, with well, and, th and things have moved out of your department. For example, yes, criminal that's justice right. for a while was in exactly. sociology. Uh, we've been the birthplace of a lot of the right. <laughs> big departments: that, uh, criminal justice, uh, social work was in our department. It seems like maybe something else I'm forgetting. At any rate, yes. Uh, that's that's true, and so we uh, had a folk, do have a focus on sociology. Uh, when I came, we also that year, hi no, the following year, we hired Andy Screa, mm -hmm. an anthropologist, and for many years he always enjoyed introducing himself. You know, hi, I'm Andy, the anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the meantime, we've hired two more anthropologists, so he can't say that anymore. So it's so the we've Department expanded of Sociology anthro. and Anthropology. Correct, today. Now. We've right. expanded Anthro. And sometimes that's one of the little tensions in the department. We can talk about right. that later. But uh, we taught a lot, as we still do, a lot of introductory sociology in the big lecture halls around campus, maybe 150, 200 mm -hmm. students. Uh, and I certainly taught my share of those sections. Uh, Bill Clute, who came with me, uh, has continued to teach some of those large sections. Although over the years we've had a little more resource and we've tried to offer smaller sections of introductory sociology because you can have obviously more interaction with the students. It's a better learning experience. I, I think it's unfortunate all universities do it. We take freshmen right out of high school and throw them in these big classes, 200, 500 students with very little resource, and it's a, it's a difficult transition. So we've tried to offer smaller sections. Have you ever, had you ever taught a big course like that before in graduate no, school or any place? No. At Carolina, I, uh, for a couple years to earn income, I taught social problems, but those classes were probably about 40 students. So well, no, I can I remember walking in my first semester teaching here, walking into that huge lecture hall in uh, the engineering yes. building, this building we're in right now. Correct. And uh, that, and you could barely see the students right. in the top row. Right. Of it, so uh, I've, I've taught away. in there too, and it is a little daunting. Was a, isn't yes, it, it was. <laughs> oh, a little funny little story. I remember once I don't know I had a cold or something, and I forgot I had my microphone on, and I sneezed, and I blew my nose with the mic. <laughs> it was a little embarrassing. <laughs> but yeah, that was a difficult teaching, and it was impossible to learn the names of the students and. Uh, pretty impersonal. So well, you've I, told us a little bit. You've mentioned a couple of department chairmen that were here in sociology when you came here. Uh, let's talk about your role as a department yes. chair in sociology. What kind of challenges did you face okay. as a department chair? Before I get into that, let me just mention one thing. Um, sure. The first chair of the Department of Sociology here, and kind of the, founding, the founder of the department, was T. Earl Sullinger. And he came here in, I think, the mid to later 20s, 1920s, uh, and uh, was a one-man department for many years and quite an eminent sociologist, uh, one of those early 19th century academics you really have to admire today, little resource. I would assume taught probably a 15-hour load, and he published a half a dozen books and a lot of articles and uh, was president of the Midwest Sociological mm -hmm. Society. Well, as it happened, uh, when I came here, Ken Root was an established professor, I don't know if you remember Ken, in the department. Mm -hmm. And he was a friend of Dr. Sullinger, and the upshot of that was uh, my early years here, I rented a house from Dr. Sullinger and got to know him, and uh, he, actually his house was right across the street, so he always wanted to know about the sociology department, and occasionally he'd give me journals to take uh. in. And real pleasant, of course, he was an older fellow when I got to know him. So um, there is that kind of, I think, important and interesting historical I'm trying connection. to remember who was department chair when I came here. I think it was Ed something. He went down to Missouri. He to must have been right before that. Yeah. Before me, right. Because yeah. I've heard about him, but I didn't know him. It was uh, like uh, Helling and then Wheeler and then George Barger. Yeah, uh, the older I here. get, the yes. harder it is to remember <laughs> the And there names. are more names to right, remember, too. Right. Challenges in sociology. Uh, we well, you've mentioned one, a little, a little bit of conflict sometimes between sociology yes, and anthropology. Right, right. Where that often comes to a head is when we have a position opening up. Uh, are we going to hire a sociology or an anthropology, or are we going to 
write the uh, job description to hire either, depending on mm -hmm. credentials. And so, so that is one of the things. So there is that difference. We uh, have faculty in sociology with uh, a number of other academic interests. One of the things I was able to do as chair, and I'm, I'm pleased with this, I got three new faculty lines for the department, and this is, you're well aware, has been a tight budget era when there isn't, isn't much money for that. The way I managed to do this was develop a series of joint lines. So, for example, we were able to get a new line in anthropology and Native American studies. Uh, we got a line in when you use the word line, you're talking about budget line. Uh, yes, I'm so sorry, that. but exactly, right. Uh, we had a line in sociology, black studies. So, uh, and currently we have a number of faculty who are affiliated with the Women's Studies program. Professor Govea is assistant director of the uh, Office of Latino Studies. But the, but the point being, uh, we have faculty with a lot of diverse interests. So, for example, Beth Ritter spends half her time teaching Native American studies and half teaching uh, anthropology. And that makes for a difficult department to uh, chair because people have different goals for the department. They have quite different interests. And then, and we all pride ourselves on this, but I, I think as chair I get a little extra credit. We are a very uh, demographically uh, diverse department. I think we're the most diverse uh, department on campus. A majority of the faculty are women. Uh, we have uh, ethnic group, sexual preference, as you name it, we have, which I, we all think, but I especially as chair thought it was important that our faculty should to some degree mirror the larger society so students have role models in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So those are all the pluses, but on the other hand, given all that diversity of interest and background and not to mention uh, intellectual interests, whether it's uh, uh, in my case, social inequality or complex organizations or medicine. Uh, so people go in different directions. And so, yes, it is a challenge. And we, usually we, we manage to work things out pretty cordially. Uh, and we still do things by Robert's Rules of Orders and take a majority vote. So the chair, we don't, I'm not a department head that was not a head. I was a chair. Well, there were, um, you, you stayed in that job for quite a while. Yes. Uh, Thirteen and a half years. Well, there years. must have been some rewards. What were? What are you? Well, there what were. Was the major reward. Well, let me you? say here, um, I was slated to become chair in the fall of 1993, and Elaine Hess, I think you remember Elaine, Very who well. had uh, went on to become a, a vice chancellor. Uh, Elaine was kind of temporary chair there for a time between Boyd Latrell and between when I uh, had a book I was working. On. I wanted to get that done. At any rate. Uh, I, uh, Elaine was chair. Well, she had a heart attack uh, uh, in the fall semester. So I suddenly and unexpectedly got thrown into chairing in January of 93 instead of fall of 93. And we were undergoing one of those periodic seven-year reviews at that time. So there I was, a brand new chair, trying to figure out what I needed to do and uh, had to face the getting us successfully through that uh, that external uh, review of the department. One of the things I remember you uh, as dean, you uh, conducted these kind of ch periodic chair schools and helped to give us some orientation. And that, uh, that, was, that was helpful. I did, uh, one of the challenges, I forget the question immediately asking, but I say one of the challenges was that uh, as chair during those 13 and a half years, I served under uh, four different deans, yourself, uh, Dean Newton, uh, Jim Malik, uh, John Flocken, and of course now Shelton Hendricks. Uh, Dean Malik, as you know, is your, uh, he followed you here. But for a very short time. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say, which was a real disappointment. Uh, I certainly like Malik. I think most all the chairs, most of the faculty did. He was a very creative, exuberant uh, guy. It was nice to get somebody in from the outside who had different experiences. Well, uh, he was on the make. He was here one year and left to take a job in Florida. And there was a little bit of unhappiness, if not bitterness, that you know he would come and kind of use us in a way and then uh, take off. And I know a few years later there was an opening in one of the vice chancellorships here and he applied. And of course, he wasn't even considered and then a f friend of mine in the department at Colorado State told me a few years later he had applied for a 
chancellorship there, and they, of course, had gotten word, you know, that he job hopped, and they weren't interested. So in some ways, I don't know where he is now. A nice guy, but he may have hurt himself a little bit that way. Now you asked me a question that I had oh, forgotten. I was asking you about the rewards of the chairmanship. Yes. Though. Okay. The, the that's good it. About it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In addition to all of the, <laughs> there are. Uh, to me, one of the biggest satisfactions is uh, helping the department grow, getting resources for the department and for the individual faculty in the department. I think uh, part of my view of, of the role of chair, you have to be a cheerleader. You have to be a cheerleader mm -hmm. for the department. Uh, for the individuals in the department, you have to help meet their needs, you have to convey the needs of the department to the dean and uh, on up the line. And to me that was, uh, while frustrating at times, it was, it was a lot of fun. As I like to say, uh, in my 38th year now at UNO, I've had one employer but many different jobs because we kind of sure. have the privilege as an academic of reinventing ourselves. And, and certainly one of those uh, most challenging and fun different jobs was being a chair. And as I mentioned, I was successful in getting us three new lines and saw some growth in the department, uh, diversifying the curriculum. Um, and so that, that was one of the big uh, rewards. There is a little monetary reward, a summer stipend. I don't remember now what it is even, not much, and maybe $300 a month during the academic. The money, let's put it this way, the money is not enough to make anybody do it. Uh, but I think it's, uh, for me at least, the satisfaction of helping the department grow, kind of the enthusiasm of doing something new. And uh, I must say, personally, one of the perks that it certainly made it possible, actually, uh, the standard contractual teaching load here, as you know, is nine hours a semester if you're doing research, three hours of research time. Uh, and the chair, chair has a six-hour administrative load, so I was teaching one class a semester. In my view, the administrative responsibilities of the chair are more than six hours of teaching <laughs> but yeah, I was certainly to, uh, say for the benefit of our audience who are not in the academic world when you talk about uh, three hours that doesn't mean you just spend three hours a week as a, uh, as a department chairman uh, very important you say that's the equivalent of teaching a three-hour course yes there's a I think a lot of misconception in the community that we waltz in the class and a few three times hours a week. is a number of credits Yes, hours right. that the student gets for the course, I'd and they actually put in a lot more work than the three hours that they go to uh, right. class. We hope the students put in more work, right. and we certainly know the faculty. We know do. the faculty. Do. I just well, at saw least, uh, at least most of them. Yes, that, there are. Yeah, we're talking about the <laughs> dedicated faculty. I just saw a report fresh out this week that uh, across the country, the average. A uh, faculty member puts in about 55 hours a week. Of course, some more, some less. But just so yes, it's important to correct that. Too. But anyhow, uh, if I were teaching the normal three preparations, uh, teaching no, nobody could, you couldn't chair. And I'm still carrying on a research program. I pride myself. I think I was one of the few chairs. There were there were some in the college who managed to continue a research program while chairing. Yeah, and I'd like to talk to you more about sure. that. That's, uh, but I want to, there's one yes. other thing I want to get to, right. uh, because I think it's one of the more interesting aspects of, uh, of uh, what you do. And uh, that is, uh, you know, I can't, anybody who looks at your resume immediately notices that you've had lots of things like summer institutes and seminars and uh, many of them in Canada or abroad, in France yes. and other places. Uh, and I'd like to know a little bit about them and and how you got interested. I see yes. this word coming up continuously in these various things, the w uh, French word francophonie. Okay, sure. Uh, what what no, does I'm that mean to, and tell us time about it? <laughs> <laughs> Not uh, a whole lot. I understand. <laughs> I, uh, as I mentioned, I left my undergraduate years and one of the big highlights there was uh, I had a minor in French. My father had taken German as his language at Purdue, which for an engineer in the 30s made sense, but with the name Rousseau I wanted to study French. I uh, loved the language, uh, loved the, the culture, and uh, for many years I, uh, then I, of course you go to graduate school, that's all on the back burner, mm. and surviving and starting the career. and. The, uh, I was working, as I said, in the sociology of education then. But for many years, I kind of increasingly, I wanted to begin to 
develop my interests uh, in French society and culture and my language ability sociologically, I, but I didn't know how to do it. I was sort of kicking around here. And I, again, one of the great academic highlights of my career, I landed a National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Fellowship to Harvard in 1979 and had the privilege of working with Larry Wiley, who was the Dillon Professor of French Civilization. He was really anointed, really a very personable guy. It turned out he was a Hoosier's uh, oh, uh, fellow okay. Hoosier of all things, and no wonder he was such a nice guy. Uh, and he helped me kind of uh, figure out what I could do sociologically with my French interests, which at the time uh, the newly elected socialist government had, in France had done something very unprecedented. Uh, France is a very centralized state. Decisions are made in Paris. But under the socialists, uh, they set up about 20-some regions around the country and gave them real administrative powers, taxation, expenditure, and the like something more or less equivalent uh, to our state legislatures here. Well, I had always thought of a kind of socialism as a kind of change from above and, and from the top, and got interested in this, so um, two things came together. I, m I managed to get some money to go over, spend a summer studying that. The other thing was, since about fourth grade, I had promised my son, Mark Jr., if he studied French all through grade school, all through high school, I'd take him to France for the summer. <laughs> and so he did that. So in 82, we had a wonderful summer together in France, and I uh, did work then on the regions and um, came back and uh, at a meeting, happened to meet a uh, political scientist from Lincoln, Ray Zariski who had a similar interest in the regions of Italy. And so we got together and said, hmm, we're both interested in regionalism, regional development. And the upshot, uh, we wrote this book on uh, uh, regionalism and regional devolution and uh, had a good time, which I got to say one thing here. I wanted to be sure and get in, and that is my experience uh, with my career here is there's a lot of serendipity, chance, uh, and opportunity. Sometimes you can create opportunity, yeah, sometimes it uh, hits you in the head. Right? And so I've never been one to do a five-year plan because to me, I, you know, I, I expect things to happen. Uh, so back to the, uh, that's how the French interests got started. Uh, after I got the book out, uh, I was kind of looking for a new horse to ride, and a friend uh, sent me an announcement about the Quebec Summer Seminar, which is something that the State University of New York at Plattsburgh, in your old area, mm -hmm. uh, sponsors every summer. They take a group of about 15 or 20 academics to uh, Quebec for a week to 10 days, kind of intensive opportunity to meet uh, academics, uh, politicians, journalists, and the like. Well, all I knew about Quebec, and that was about 1970. Not, I'm sorry, about 19, mid-80s, late 80s, 1988. All I knew about Quebec at that time was there was this weird place in Canada where they speak French. And so I went to that seminar and immediately, as you would expect of a good sociologist with an interest in inequality, got interested in the separatist, mo separatist movement, the national question, and what was driving that. And spent a lot of summers there uh, doing research on that. Uh, finally satisfied myself, okay. Uh, I, 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 what I, my conclusion in a nutshell there was what really drives separatism is not uh, ethnicity and, and speaking French. Uh, it's economic, uh, economics and, and political power. For many years, the, the French in Quebec were kind of subordinate citizens, somewhat like African Americans in the U.S. And that all changed in the 50s and 60s with the Quiet Revolution. And so it's really about opportunities for, for French speakers in Quebec, who constituted uh, the, the native French speakers, about 80% of the population. So that was some of the most fascinating research I've ever done. Uh, then this leads to another little interesting story, uh, interesting person. I, I, I thought this Francophonie was uh, developing uh, internationally at the time, and that is an organization of French-speaking nations around the world that obviously have in common the Thai of speaking French to a greater or mm -hmm. lesser degree, includes many of the former French colonies, obviously. Uh, Canada, Quebec, Belgium, France are big players as, as well as many other countries. But I got interested in that and what, what their issues were. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Professor Jody Nethery Castro uh, came to UNO. If you remember, uh, you've probably talked to Orv Menard in political science. And uh, he was a professor there of French politics. 
and when Orv retired, they were hiring, uh, recruiting. Uh, Orv came around and told me, hey, Mark, we got this candidate, uh, Jody, uh, coming in, and she's going to be giving her job talk on, on the French regions. She had also done her dissertation on the French. I said, oh, well, I had some kind of a conflict. I couldn't go, and Orv came around later and said, when she got here, she said, you mean Rousseau of Rousseau and Zariski is here at UNO? And she'd actually <laughs> cited our book and our dissertation. So I said, that woman is brilliant. You better hire her. <laughs> so when she got here, I, I introduced myself to Jody, and we quickly agreed. We had some common interests and did a little work in Quebec, and we both got interested in this uh, Francophonie organization. And uh, I've been on academic leave, uh, sabbatical leave, last fall and again this fall. Uh, at the suggestion of a friend, I took a one-year leave, which the way that works here, if you take a one-year leave, you go on half salary. But a friend suggested, uh, why do it all in one year? The upshot was I took last fall and this fall for the leave, which has worked out very nicely. It kind of takes the pressure off, gives me a little time to think about it in between. So we are, uh, she's on leave this fall also, and we're working on a book on language politics with a focus on uh, the Francophonie organization. But I have always loved to travel. Uh, as a kid, the parents took us around on regular vacations, and we did the typical middle class thing one summer, the Great Western Trek out, so the, from the Yellowstone to the Grand Canyon in between. And so I really enjoyed traveling, and my, as I said, I never expected to come to UNO, but my research interests have been such that they give me a lot of opportunity to travel. That's that's been really satisfying. And you mentioned the Grand Canyon. I should. Oh stick yes, in a, uh, absolutely. Uh, in we terms. know each other quite well yes. because we spent uh, spent a week together uh, yes. rafting the uh, Colorado River through the Grand you, Canyon. You get to know somebody better when you. <laughs> right. Yes, I must say, Jack, twice you did this. Put together these wonderful uh, raft trips yeah. through the Grand Canyon, and well, we don't want to spend too much no, time. No, my on son that, went I with me both times. Wonderful it. experience. <laughs> I, I got to say, in that line, I also. Uh, I am a golfer, not a good one, but I have enjoyed over the years playing in the student faculty uh, golf league here. Well, we've got uh, so many things that are still left to talk about here, and uh, I'd like to uh, talk to you a little bit about your research, and we can't go through all of it because sure. you've got a vast number of uh, things that you've done. But can you tell us uh, in layman's terms now, so that sure. we don't confuse anybody, what are some of the projects that you've considered the most interesting that yes. you've done over the years? Uh, again, I want to go back to Quebec, and um, I was and remain just so uh, intrigued by the separatist movement there. I might say uh, some may recall that um, twice uh, in the last 20 years there have been referenda in Quebec as to whether or not it should secede from Canada and become a separate nation, or the Quebecois nation. And they, uh, Quebecers, the majority of Quebecers tend to refer to themselves as Quebecois, the French word for Quebecer. And uh, when you ask them where they're from, or their, their nation, or nation, is, is Quebec, Quebec. And um, anyhow, these two referenda, the second one was, Gads, when was that? Maybe 92, I'm a little rusty on. At any rate, the second referendum about should Quebec secede from Canada failed by less than 1%. I mean, there, there was that much support for uh, a separate um, national state. And so that's always intrigued me, what, what drives that. And uh, I, I really think it has more to do with the economic and, and social issues. Um, as I said, uh, workers and many middle class uh, French speakers for years couldn't really advance because English was the language of management, uh, and and the English uh, really ran Quebec, and that began to change, uh, like so many things in the U.S. in the 50s and on into the 60s with the so-called Quiet Revolution, and uh, in the 1960s the Parti Québécois, which was the French separatist party that advocated separatism, uh, for the first time was elected uh, to govern in Quebec. The uh, uh, the Prime Minister and the majority of the uh, legislators were members of the Parti Québécois. That's when they put up that first referendum, and then again there was a second one. And while we don't hear much about it in the U.S. today, that separatist sentiment is still pretty strong, and a lot of uh, 
young people uh, you know, in their 20s and so are pretty adamant uh, separatists, or at least they want an autonomous Quebec. And again, the big thing is uh, that Quebec, uh, I'm sorry, that French be the language of the workplace. It, it is the national language of the Quebec mm -hmm. state. S sort of a paradox here, there's a federal law in Canada that all Canadians uh, uh, have the right to be served in French and English. Uh, in Quebec, there is a provincial law that French is the national language of Quebec. So all immigrants to Quebec learn French. Now, many of them learn English. So that is real fascinating. And then more recently, I've got interested in the Francophonie and the, their concerns with the trade issues with WTO. Uh, one of the interesting things there I'll just mention is uh, in passing here is that Many of these governments, France in particular, but just about all the governments in the French-speaking nations have historically subsidized their arts industries, film, uh, television, publishing, the like. Well, uh, under World Trade Organization, WTO uh, rules, uh, that is looked at and are defined as kind of illegal government support. Uh, and, of course, the Hollywood media corporations, large, really oligopolies like Time Warner, uh, complain about that. So that's one of the major uh, bones of contention here between much of the French-speaking world and the English-speaking world, something we in the U.S. are pretty well unaware of. But now, let me ask you a um, <coughs> question, because you've been talking about your research, and I, I mentioned originally that... Uh, You've got a uh, a number of pages of articles and other things that yes. you've written, on, uh, and you've d obviously done a lot of research. This is UNO has been pri primarily really an undergraduate institution Correct. over the yes. years. How did you ever find the uh, time and the motivation to do all of this stuff? Oh, I, don't <laughs> uh, I have been lucky to have uh, two uh, sabbatical leaves over the year, which helped a lot. The, the first book I wrote with Ray Zariski, I managed to work on sabbatical. Uh, I guess, uh, sort of like I survived graduate school in Chapel Hill, the nose to the stone, just because I find these, uh, these research issues uh, so interesting. I love uh, using the language. I, I pride myself on having a pretty good, uh, good reading ability, adequate speaking ability. And so I, it's just been important to me, to my uh, identity and, and the pleasure. Uh, and I like going to professional meetings where I uh, can interact and uh, ideas with other people who have similar interests. Jody, Nethery Castro now being one of them. I, but uh, that, I think, is the main motivating factor, just uh, intellectual well, satisfaction. Well, you're talking about time. It's not only time to do research, but you've spent lots of time on other things, too. You mentioned... Uh, uh, some of the um, professional organizations, for example, yes. uh, Midwest Sociological Society. You've had a number of roles in yes, that organization. Yes, I have. And that takes time, Yes, too. it does. And i got to say here locally at UNO, probably one of the most time-consuming but uh, satisfying assignments I had and began under you was a uh, stint on the Dean's uh, Advisory Committee. Right. And one of the, perhaps the major function of that committee is to annually assess faculty who are going up for a reappointment, promotion, and tenure. Right. And I've always thought that was the most important and most satisfying committee assignment I've had here. Very yeah, of course, kind I obviously agree memory. with you completely there. <laughs> yeah, right. But well, uh, the dean needs some guidance. <laughs> but it, it, it but that's uh, that's something I hope some uh, faculty members are uh, watching. Uh, yes, watching uh, this program it's and uh, really hearing important. you say that because uh, I keep telling people that it's such an important thing to be able to to take the time to find the time, if necessary, right. to, to uh, serve at least one stint on one of these right. committees because you do such a great service to the, the rest of the faculty. Exactly. And, you, uh, and it's, uh, it's important to get people who are very good at it, as you were, uh, and who understand the academic environment rather than somebody who's saying, well, I want to have something to put on my resume. Yes, you know, I, it's agree. A, I agree. Uh, so it's important that, uh, that really good people uh, take the time to do this sort of thing. In addition to advising the dean, that committee kind of serves as a check on all the departments in the college to, to make sure that you know comparable right. standards yeah. are applied to people. Uh, and 
it was I served two different times, chair for a time, and uh, uh, really important and but really enjoyable kind of work. It's personally, it's fun to see what other people in other departments are doing. That's one of the benefits. But I absolutely agree. Too many people today think, well, I don't have time or I'm unwilling to do that and it is unfortunate. That's, well, I, I hope too that we're giving <laughs> some insight into the uh, academic environment to uh, people watching this program yes. who, uh, who don't understand that uh, college professors do a lot more than uh, than teach a, yes, teach a class walk into the three class. hours a, uh, right. a week right. uh, that's, uh, that they can be with between uh, research which uh, uh, which gives you something to teach. That's uh, you're mm -hmm. developing the knowledge that you're then going to pass on to to the students. Right. Um, but uh, besides that, you have the uh, the responsibility, as I've just tried to to uh, emphasize, to uh, help the university grow and develop. And uh, right. I mean, as academics, most all of us want collegial governance. That is to say, we want uh, professors to have a voice in decision making. But to do that, we have to be willing to play our role to, to help provide inputs. Uh, I'd like to do two things more yes. before we, uh, we've got uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, one thing is to have a chance to ask you what are the major significant changes you've seen in the past 38 years that you've been here at the university. And the other one is to talk about uh, any people that you've known that uh, have been uh, at the university sure. here who you think have really influenced uh, the development of UNO that you may not have yeah. already mentioned because we talked guess, about some uh, of that. I guess first of all on changes the obviously the most visible is the the growth in the campus and the, as we've mentioned the uh, the student body less visible I think are the addition of new disciplines of a much more varied faculty and I, uh, not just demographically, but intellectually. It's intellectually a more exciting place to be. People are doing more research now. There's there's more support for research, if you will, more encouragement. It's always been there, but there's more of it going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot. We obviously continue to recruit nationally, but we're a bigger place. So intellectually, I think that's the most important. Uh, again, not so visible but uh, exciting thing and that obviously benefits the students here in the classroom getting exposure to a variety of faculty who are really doing some exciting uh, things. A couple important people I want to mention, uh, I guess Bernie Colossa, and I don't know if you ever talked to Bernie, longtime professor in political science. I knew Bernie very well, right. but he um, unfortunately yes. died at he a rather checked young out age on us and too we early. never were, I was never right. able to interview him. Right. He also served on the Omaha Public Schools Board of Education right. here. I think for us as professors, the important thing about Bernie, it was obviously a group effort, but more than anyone, he was sort of the fire plug who brought uh, collective bargaining to UNO, which gives the faculty kind of legal standing under the collective bargaining agreement, the contract. And I've always thought that was important. We've always had good relations with the administration, and we continue. I'm grateful we aren't one of the places, whether it's that kind of destructive conflict. But I think it's important for faculty to have kind of some legal standing and the contract provides a place to uh, work that out and regularize issues and so grievances can be handled in a very systematic kind of way. And I guess this just wouldn't be complete if I didn't mention Sophie Katz, perhaps you remember Oh my so goodness, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Long time. Departmental uh, secretary yes. for many, many years. Many years. Uh, and that was back way before word processing. It was a thrill for her when we got an IBM Selectric. <laughs> and so everything, uh, syllabi, uh, VTI, everything had to be typed anew. Uh, and she did all of that for a, a department of, I don't know, 10 faculty or so. Uh, every now and then I've run into Mrs. Katz at the opera uh, here in town. And you may recall her husband died some years ago and then she remarried. And I, I remember one of the last times I saw her, sort of humorous, I was, you know, Mrs. Katzing this and that. And her <laughs> husband said, hey, buddy, her name isn't Mrs. Katz anymore. <laughs> Which I don't remember. To me, she'll always be Mrs. Katz, yeah, right. of course. Anyhow, she was a, a wonderful department secretary and uh, just, uh, I, I thought, a really important person. 
Uh, back a little bit to the French things, uh, Elvira Garcia, as you know, was chair of the languages department for many years. And uh, after I came back from that summer NEH seminar at Harvard, and really was kind of going full, beginning to go full bore on my interest in French politics, uh, she came around and invited me to come to the Alliance Francaise uh, meeting, which Alliance Francaise is an international organization of uh, people who speak French and people who are interested in France, and we have a chapter here. And uh, so I began to do that, and I still go occasionally, and uh, it's a lot of fun. There was just a, uh, our opening fall meeting at uh, her home a couple of weeks ago, and it's, uh, it's a nice time to speak a little French. A lot of surprising number of French nationals here in Omaha, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, I, I credit uh, Elvira for that. We've of course had some outstanding. Elvira, uh, of course, is fluent in four languages. Yes, so. I yes, and <laughs> I French, must, English, uh, uh, Spanish, Italian, of course, and, uh, Spanish. Right, and <laughs> she's taught all of those except English. And uh, yeah, she's one of those people with a natural ear, and I must say, I as much as I she's love a good French, friend. So. Oh, uh, yeah, and I've interviewed her in this. Oh, I, I'll have to watch <laughs> that. I really have to. Uh, I'm not a natural uh, language person. I mean, I, I've gotten decent in French, but I do have to work at it. I'm not like Elvira. I can't just. Uh, and I should mention that uh, I have a little background there myself. My um, my mother was born in France. Oh, really? I guess. And I, her I family came really? from okay. uh, well, way in the. Um, Way in the east, uh, um, Strasbourg, uh, Franche Comte. Okay, okay. Hey, did you study French in school? Yes, I did. Well, you mm -hmm. should. Good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of us closet uh, Francophiles uh, around. So. <laughs> and we've had, of course, a number of really fine uh, graduate students, masters students over the years, and uh, a couple of them uh, that I think have gone to really nice. Uh, Success. Scott Hunt got his master's mm -hmm. here and then went off to get his PhD. He's now a professor at uh, Kentucky. Yeah, I was going to ask you about students because yes. uh, we have about one minute left. And do you, okay. you have any other students you wanted to mention? Gail Miller was an old buddy here, got his uh, master's with us in sociology, um, early 70s. Uh, we quickly became friends, and he's now a professor, a former department chair at Marquette. Yeah, in, that's, uh, it's always great Real to nice have guy. students like that who have oh, been is. so successful. And I love seeing them at the meetings uh, and the like. So, Well, Mark, uh, thank you very much for coming in this morning and spending some time with us. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. I hope you have, too, and I think we've learned a little bit. It's been a pleasure. Nice to be living history. And uh, to our audience, thank you for joining us today in a visit with Dr. Mark Rousseau, longtime professor of sociology at UN Omaha. We've been taking a look at some of the history of UN Omaha as seen through the eyes of the history makers. This is Jack Newton. I'm inviting you to join us again in the series we call Reflections in Time. Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913.